Hi, I'm Heidi Otway, your host for this Conversations on Cannabis virtual forum, brought to you by the Medical Marijuana Education and Research Initiative at Florida A&M University. In this conversation, we're talking about advanced drug testing and how it could impact people who use cannabis. So let's talk and learn about this subject with our guests. Kelly Dobbins has more than 25 years of experience in the drug testing industry and conducts individual, employment, school, federal, and court-ordered drug and alcohol testing, as well as training and education. She is currently serving as the Board of Directors Vice President for the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Association. Kelly, it's good to have you on the show. Thanks. Good to see you. Good. Our other guest is Zathan Bhutan, who is a cert who's certified in drug and alcohol testing that consists of hair follicle, fingernail, and saliva testing. He is a graduate of the Occupational Safety and Health Academy and is a member of the National Association of Safety, Safety Professionals. Zathan, it's good to have you on the forum. Thanks. Nice for having me. Great. To everyone joining us on this live program, please share, post, and tag a friend on Facebook to have them join this conversation. If you're on YouTube, share the link so others can join us as well. During the forum, we want you to send us your questions in the comment box, and we'll do our best to have our guests answer them. We also want you to tell us what you think about this forum by completing the survey that will be posted in the comments on YouTube and Facebook after the live program. Your name will be entered into a drawing on May 11th, 2023 to win a $100 gift card provided by one of Mary's partners. Now, let's start this conversation on cannabis. Kelly, I'm going to start with you. What are the most common types of drug testing? Uh, we have urine, hair, and saliva, which is also considered oral fluid. Mm -hmm. Urine um, is probably the oldest method. goes back when you're testing marijuana. It goes back two to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Hair, a typical hair test, half inch of hair is uh, 30 days. So a typical hair test is an inch and a half of hair. So you've got a 90-day window. Mm -hmm. And oral fluid is one of the newer um methodologies and it it goes back a, a day possibly two if you're a heavy user mm -hmm. all right Zathan, did you want to add anything to that or did kelly cover it all yeah i think she's covered everything that's great well Zathan, let me um ask you a question then when and why are drug tests usually conducted well for work wise it's a pre-employment incidents accidents uh injuries and what they call random. So it, it, it just varies and depends on your job and your responsibilities at your company that you're going to get drug tested. Mm -hmm. Kelly, in your experience, what are other reasons, if any, that folks would you know conduct a drug test on someone? Usually, um, you know, you've got some court order cases, you've got probation, you've got divorce cases where they're looking at child custody. That, that comes up a lot in our area. But as far as workplace, you know, he mentioned all of them, pre-employment, post-accident, reasonable suspicion, and random. So. so who typically requests these drug tests of, of individuals? Who, you know, what entity is doing that? Normally it's, <laughs> normally it's going to be the employer. If it's court, it's normally going to be a lawyer that's gone in front of a judge. And so the judge is requesting it. Probation's the same way. It would be court ordered. So the judge would have said, you have to get drug testing and then the probation officer would be the one sending, you know, the person to get the test. Mm -hmm. Zathan, did you want to add to that? No, that's, you know, that's what I say, you know, with probation, it's a little bit, you know, with law is a little bit different when it comes to judge orders and court orders because there's not as, it's no rules to what they do. They just come in and say, hey, here you are, do what you have to do and we'll take it with you. So it's no, it, not so much being certified or anything, it's just a court order that you have to follow. Employer-wise, it's uh, you have to you know meet certain verification before you can do certain drug tests. Okay, it, was there a process in all of this? You know, for drug testing, so the employer or an individual or an organization says this person needs to drug, take a drug test. What happens after that, Kelly? You want to tell me about that? Sure. Normally, what we're going to require is some type of an authorization. So the person. The employer would sign off on an authorization saying, I'm sending Johnny Smith for a pre-employment drug test. 
is supposed to show up on Friday, um, whatever day that is, between this time and this time. And so when Johnny shows up next week with an authorization, then we're going to call that employer and say, do you still want us to drug test it? He's a late week. You know, he's, he's a week late. Do you still want us to drug test it? So the authorization is very important. And really the same thing, um, I'll let him speak on probation, but really the same thing with any other type of order. If they're supposed to be here today or tomorrow and they show up next week, then we know there's probably something wrong. David, tell us more. <laughs> like, like Ms. Kelly said, you know, that's normally the, the procedure of, of how it goes. And if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Kelly, they, you know, if it's like a week late, will, will that be considered a fail? It all depends on the employer of, of what they're being tested for. Right. In law enforcement, it's a little bit different when you come to probation and things like that. If a judge orders it and you don't show up or you duck in your, you know, what they call your PO, which is probation officer. Mm -hmm. Now, at that moment, it's up to him to say, well, you know what? I've chased you for a week now. Instead of me doing this drug test, I can just bring you with me. So it's a, it's a big difference with the two, but it's all the same. After a week, like Ms. Kelly was saying, you're pretty much trying to clean your system up. You're trying to flush that system to get it to the, the norm or the, the zero tolerance of any type of uh, habitual that's inside your system. Okay, well, that's a perfect segue into this burning question that I had. How do people cheat when they take a drug test? <laughs> I know you, you know the best way to cheat. <laughs> How do they cheat? Just curious. Well, Kelly, they're, bringing, they're bringing someone else's urine in now. We all have a saying and around these parts anyway, is you never use a microwave at a gas station because someone's heated up their urine in it to bring it into the facility. No. And Nathan can tell you that you can have really cold urine and you can have really hot urine. So if you come in and you have really hot urine, we're gonna make you we're gonna make you wait a few minutes. It may take us a few minutes to get a picture of you or take your driver's license or fill out some forms because we wanna make sure that urine cools down before we take it back. Okay, am I hearing you correctly? You said people will take it to a gas station and put it in the microwave near the Slurpees and the coffee yes. scene, heat it up, and then come to you to take a drug test? Well, fortunately, we have a gas station right beside us, so it's very common here. We've even had some of the employees call us and let us know that one of our customers was on our way to, on their way over to see us. Uh, it's it's quite humorous at times. I know Zathan has a bunch of stories. I'm sorry, that's just gross. <laughs> Zathan, can you ask to that, please? Well, like she was saying, you know, if when they come in and it's too hot, they get the antsy pants, oh, I have to go right now, I need to go right now. So at that moment, now you have to just sit and say, okay, well, sit right here and wait. They don't want to sit down because the plastic goes against their skin that's burning them. So they don't want to sit down. They're constantly moving. And you say, look, I need you to sit down. You're making me nervous. Just, you know, I need you to relax for me. You know, and they can't relax at this whole time. They're getting third degree burns on their legs or where they have it at. You sit them there and you, and you jump around on me. Actually, you want something to drink. You need some, you need some water. So now, you, you know, at some point, they're going to either get up and leave. They're going to take it off. It's going to, it's going to spill on them or something's going to happen to where you say, okay, here we are. So it's, it's just one of those deals that if, you, if you're in a rush to go, it's a problem nine times out of 10. Right. Okay. Anything, any other methodologies or ways that folks uh, try to cheat on their drug tests or that, that what you shared is? Well, they're bringing a prosthetic or, uh, you know, it's all types of ways that people try. You know, they try to uh, put things on their fingernails. They've tried to. It, it's a lot of different ways that they can try to cheat it, cheat the system. But at, at the end of the day, because you hear all kinds of things that, oh, we use this, or do this, try that. Or when you do a half follicle, they'll come in with extensions or things like that and thinking, okay, they're going to cut the extension and not realize we've got to make you take it out. So it's a lot of things that people, you know, cheat on. I've, I've told a guy, you know, congratulations, you're pregnant. And... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> use his wife urine and I've wow. had one, you know, use animal urine. So it's, it, it, it's, it's just different ways people try everything. Wow. But I guess the lesson here is that you're probably going to get caught. Yes. Yes.
probably going to get caught. So are there federal restrictions or laws regarding drug testing for people? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, and that's where it, it, that's where the big difference lies at, because now with marijuana being legal in certain states and certain counties, this is where a lot of people say, well, it's legal. I can have it. Well, yes, it is legal in certain places, but when it comes to federal, it's not legal at all. So that's where the, 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 that thin line comes in, because federal guidelines is totally different from state and local guidelines. So when you're dealing with federal or marine or whatever it may be, it just depends on the laws and the rules of what entity you're dealing with is going to come down to the laws that there are. So for us, federal laws, it's totally different from state laws. State laws in Florida, it may be legal. In Louisiana, marijuana is not legal. Right. So each state is different. In California and Colorado is legal, but the thing that they don't understand is you're transporting all these things. Now you're committing federal crimes mm. instead of state crimes. So that's where the drug testing side come in at to where it all depends on where you are, the state that you're in, how are we going to proceed with your drug and alcohol testing? Mm -hmm. So how would someone, and Kelly, maybe you can answer this. How would someone who is using medical cannabis legally or they're in a state where recreational use is legal, how would they find out what the rules are in case they have to get drug tested? Well, currently there's 38 states plus D.C. that have some type of legalized marijuana you've got um 23 plus dc that are uh recreational and 16 that are medical that's a large number yeah uh we know tennessee where i am is the last holdout so we'll probably never get either one of those <laughs> but we're surrounded by states that have all the states around us you know so it's the same thing zathan was saying you know you're crossing lines the main difference is like in Tennessee, you can only have some type of cannabis oil that's 0.03, contains 0.03 THC or less. Mm -hmm. If you're going to the, I'm going to use the gas station again. It's not that I'm beating up on gas stations. It just happens to be what's next door to my office. So if you go to the gas station, you buy one of those vape pens or gummies, you really don't know what's in it. You know, they're, they're not sent off for purity and they're not FDA approved. And so you don't know if you're getting THC or if you're getting CBD or CBG or, or whatever it is. So that's one of the drawbacks. So the federal government, when, when we talk about that, we're talking about Department of Transportation. We're talking about your truck drivers and your pilots and your boat captains. Those people, they're, they're told don't use that. Don't use those products, even if it's okay in your state because you don't know what you're getting. And if you take a drug test for your job and you don't pass it, we don't care if it's legal in your state because it's still illegal at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So that's a good um, segue into a question I had about what industries forbid their employees from using cannabis, any form of cannabis, whether it's low THC, CBD, or you know, full on recreational. What, what industries? Zathan, you wanna talk about that? Well, and you have a uh, federal motor carrier, railroad, marine. So all these things, anything that's being safety sensitive that you can't have mm -hmm. medical, medical or not. Anything that you're doing so forth, I guess, uh, they call it safety sensitive. That means operating a forklift, uh, operating heavy machinery, driving an 18 wheeler piloting a, a ship or a boat or a tug, whatever it may be, an uh, airplane. So it all depends on anything that you're doing, safety sensitive wise. Mm -hmm. you know, a fire alarm, if, if, you know, law enforcement, uh, fire department. So it's, it, it's, it's a broad, broad spectrum. If you, you know, in, in safety, if you're going into a chemical plant, and you're the safety you know, personnel and, and you're going to be dealing with different chemicals or you're doing audits and things like that, but you still can't you know, be under the influence of marijuana, of any drug of that. Uh, right. you know, so it just depends on your job and, and what you're doing at, at that moment. Yeah. Kelly, did you want to add to that? 
Yeah, I think Zathan covered it. I mean, there's so many different categories. The main difference is it could be legal in your state, but even if you're a fire person or a fireman or firewoman in your state and you're driving, you know, the fire truck and, and you're working in that safety sensitive position, which I, all the positions at the firehouse are safety sensitive, mm -hmm. then you can't use marijuana even if it's legal because it affects your ability to do your job. Yeah. That that's where some of the methodologies come in as to, you know, you know, where are we on testing? How do we know if you're under the influence? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good um, point. So what are the new ways to test whether someone has used cannabis or if they're under the influence? You mentioned it earlier, something about, I think, oral fluids. Can you tell me about some other new methodologies that they're using to test people for cannabis and other drugs? Well, oral fluids go back, um, you know, pretty much what are you doing today? Was your guy smoking a joint at lunch on the truck? Or, you know, what, what was he doing, you know, eight hours ago? And it could go up to, you know, yesterday. One of the newer methodologies is through a company called Hound Labs, and it's a breathalyzer. Uh, what's interesting about it is that it captures your breath. It's not like a breath alcohol machine, but in our world, when you think of breathalyzer, that's what you think at. It, it does capture the breath and it goes into a capsule. And currently that capsule goes to Quest Diagnostics and they run an initial and a confirmatory screen, just like you would a urine drug test or an oral fluid drug test or, you know, e anything that's lab based like that. Um, the difference is it only goes back three hours. So what you're looking for um, in that particular case is you're looking to see if someone is actually used while they were at work, which is going to be different than if you used two nights ago at a concert. You know, if you're if you can use marijuana recreational in your state and you go to a concert and, and you smoke marijuana, just like if you were to, you know, drink a, a couple of glasses of wine, as long as it doesn't impair your ability to do your job, it shouldn't matter. But there's no way to there's no way to test that impairment. So Hound Labs has probably got the newest methodology out there as far as trying to capture that breath and only going back three hours. So that's one of our new hopes for the future right now. Okay. And then I wanted to ask a little bit more about the, the, the random, this process. I think when we were doing our, our pre-conversation, getting ready, you all talked about the random drug test, right? So you talked about, you know, there's a, a new breathalyzer that you can, they can find out if you did it within, you said a couple of hours, right? So in those instances, that's someone who's probably chosen for a random, is that correct? Or? That would be called a reasonable suspicion. That, reasonable. That, yeah, the randoms are, uh, it's computer generated. So what happens is as you get hired by your employer, your social security number, your name, everything goes to a computer. And once you get hired, you get into a, what they call a pool. It all depends on how large your company is. They can put you in a pool separately from it, all the other people. Or if you have a three to five people, they can put you in another pool with a lot of other you know, people. So, and what it does, that computer generates numbers. And as it pops out, if your social security number pops out, that's, you know, that would be your turn to go take a random. A lot of times employers when employees think, okay, why well, they're picking on me because I've been randomized, you know, they're, they're, I heard a guy say, well, why am I always randomized? Because I'm like, wait a minute, that's not even a word. I said, but okay, let's go with that. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, y'all always picking on me because y'all think I'm smoking drugs. I'm like, no, I said, it's computer generated. And after I explained to him, it's like, well, why my name keep popping up? I said, buddy, I can't tell you. The computer's a lot smarter than I am, so I can't help you with that. But I said, my name has popped up five or six times. So I said, I don't care either way, but then that's where a lot of people get confused because they're thinking you're just going in pulling their name because of who they are. And or their ethnicity too, because you have some folks who think, you know, I'm, I'm a black male or I'm Hispanic, so I'm being picked on. But what I'm hearing right. you say is that in most instances, that's not the case in a random correct. situation, correct? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. So you There's just other Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Miss Kelly. There's other ways, too. When you look at, um, especially like in drug court, they use colors like, you know, you're assigned a color when you come in 
to the program. And today, you know, your color may be blue and Zathan's color may be red. And so you call a phone every day and it says, this is the today's color. And that way, you know, you have to go get a drug test. So it, it's still random though. It's still generated by a computer because mm -hmm. you could have the color blue could be every day for three days if the computer chose it. So it would still be the same situation and it would still be the, the same random genera generator. It's just done a little differently. Okay. I want to go back to the reasonable suspicion. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Zathan? Well, the reasonable suspicion, let's just say uh, yeah, I, I'm an employee at FEMU and I come to work every day happy and everything is fine. And then one day I come to work, clothes is shoveled, I'm not shaving. I'm talking out of my head, my eyes are glossy. And, you know, I have a, a distinct odor of marijuana, you know, purported marijuana and or alcohol emitting from my breath. And you kind of like, wait a minute, he's not, he's not himself. Well, of course, a lot of people say, well, if you're, if you're a diabetic and you, you have high insulin levels, it can smell like alcohol as well. That's mm -hmm. true, but are you going to take a chance of saying, oh, he's a diabetic or you're going to monitor him for, you know, a few, a few minutes or an hour or so, document all that. You know, get your supervisor, let them know they're going to monitor as well, document everything and send this person for a random. So if it is, his, if his sugar levels are elevated, he can still get help either way. At least this person going to be well, you know, taken care of either way it goes to determine if they're high or under the influence or if they're diabetic and, they're, and their insulin level is real high. So a lot of factors go into when you're looking at someone that's, for reasonable suspicion, just depends on, you just can't tell nobody, I think they're on marijuana, I think they're drunk, or I think they're high, because you, you have to, you, the supervisor has to be trained into reasonable suspicion. Anybody just can't say, well, I think he's high, and that's it. Right. Now you have to give a written statement, you have to give documentation on the reasoning behind this person being, that you feel like something is wrong with them. So you just can't say, I think something's wrong with you, and that's it. it mm -hmm. It's a process to that. Yeah. And I guess that falls into the HR function for those who are listening. Right. And they're in the scenario is really talking to their HR department for their employer. Well, not so much. HR, but the immediate supervisor as well, because the immediate supervisors constantly, they see them every day. The yeah. HR director, whoever it may be, doesn't come in contact with them, but they will contact the HR personnel to say, hey, look, this is what we have. This mm -hmm. is what we're doing. For all this to be documented, HR is going to look at you know the reason behind it because they are trained as well. So they're gonna say, okay, well, do you have this, this, this? They want all the documentation. So once yeah. all that is done, they're gonna, you know, everything is gonna be documented and put in place with their files. So these are all, you know, all that's gonna be documented as well. So HR will be contacted in regards to reasonable suspicion or anything else for that, you know, for that reason. Yeah, Kelly, did you wanna add on to that? I was going to say that's that's where HR comes in is document, document, document. I mean, they're trained. I know Zathan trains people. And that's one of the biggest things you do with training is, like he said, this is not this person's behavior. So you have to most of the forms for reasonable suspicion have check boxes. Does mm -hmm. he smell funny? Does he look funny? You know, does is he disheveled? You know, is he standing up? Is he yelling? Is he crying? Is he whispering? You know, and those type of things kind of give them the documents that they need in order to be able to make a determination. Are we going to do a reasonable suspicion test? It may be that he's he's got a brand new baby at home. He hasn't slept in two days. You don't have any way of knowing that's where the documentation comes in. So really, the HR people are the ones behind document, 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 because that'll give us whatever we need to be able to go out and ask for that test. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask a question. I don't, and I'm not sure if you all can answer it, but let's say someone is in this scenario and they test positive and they're fired from their job because they failed a drug test. Do they have any legal recourse to try to get their job back and under those kind of situations from your experience? Do you know? I know, um, Zathan, um, I know we talked about it. It depends on the state you're in. Mm -hmm. There are some states that have, you know, made medical uh, or recreational use uh, okay. And when that happens, some of those states say you can't just be fired for a drug test. So, and I'll let Zathan go into a little bit more on that. 
Right. Now, and like Ms. Keller was saying, you know, each state have different rules and regulations, but the only difference is if it's a federal, if you're a truck driver, you're safety sensitive, all mm -hmm. that's out the window. It's all, this is what the rules are, this is what we have to do. But if you're not, let's just say, you you know, you're, you know, you're medic, you know, you're an assistant to uh, your boss and their principal or the doctor have nothing to say for sensitive. So they can say, well, now this state law said, well, you can't, this medical marijuana, is, it's approved, it's legal in this state. Well, you fail the marijuana test, you can't just fire this person because of they failed the test with marijuana. So right. that's what this kind of was saying so far is how the states and rules are. It, it's, it's kind of squirrely, but you know, when it comes to federal or your job function, that's where the rule is going to apply it. Right, right. A lot of states are taking, uh, a lot of companies are taking the marijuana out of their policies because of it, it's being legalized everywhere. So you can actually take it out of your policy and procedures if you choose to. It all depends on the job function of that person. Yeah, that was what I was about to ask. If you're seeing employers becoming more lenient for their employees who use cannabis legally, you know, in the states that allow it, are you seeing them being more lenient if there's not a safety sensitive position and allowing them to use it? Are you all seeing that? Yes. I think the main reason that you're seeing it too is because, you know, with oral fluid coming out, you've got a better determinator of, of if this person used today or if they used a week ago. And now with Hound Labs coming out with their breathalyzer, you know, if we have the tools that we need as employers, then we're going to continue to test. If we don't have the tools, then we're not going to test because we don't want to, you know, infringe on those rights. And as long as you're not driving an 18 wheel or flying a plane, mm -hmm. then and, and you're not, you know, a police officer or a fireman, then it, it's probably a moot point. Okay. Well, we are actually getting some questions from the folks who are watching the live program. Let's pull up Lisa Solomon's question. This is a good one. It says, does the breathalyzer only show if there are active THC metabolites? Can anyone take uh, that? I'm Kelly? pretty sure that's the case, but to get more information, you should go to their website. Um, it's Hound Labs. They're based out of California. Uh, my understanding is it's only showing active THC metabolites. So it's only showing currently what's in your system in the last three hours. Okay. Thank you for that response. So what are the top questions that you all hear from people who have to take a drug test for marijuana, cannabis use? What do you hear? <laughs> well, just drug testing as a whole, I've had some, I have people ask me, well, what are we looking for? I'm like, what, <laughs> what kind of question is that? We're looking for everything. Or they say, well, how can I pass it? How can uh, I pass it? Yeah, or do I have to take it today or could I take it tomorrow? Or are you doing hair follicles? You know, it's it's a number of things I've I've heard. It's like you kind of stop on your tracks, like, wait a minute, did he just ask that? But you, you don't want to show any type of, you know, you just want to kind of keep a, a stone face, but in your mind is like, wow, you know something is going on. Okay. So that raises suspicions when you get questions that says, how do I pass it? Well, people call on the phone and ask you that. They'll call on the phone and say, I got to take a drug test. How do I pass it? Well, the most common answer is don't use drugs, but it's usually too late if they're calling to ask you how. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff on the market and a lot of that stuff works if you know how to use it. But we're trying to try to thwart all those ways. Uh, so we, we're all highly trained collectors and, you know, the temperature and the way it looks and smells, not that you necessarily sniff it, but yeah. you do have to know that if it smells like bleach, it probably has bleach in it. You know, those type of things. Same thing with hair. Like he was saying, they come in with dreads or they come in with, you know, their hair, you know, with extensions. Um, there's all kinds of ways people try to, they come in with a hair piece. If you're not digging under their hair, trying to cut, from the crown of the hair underneath all their hair, you wouldn't know they had a hair piece on. So yeah. they people try to thwart the test in a lot of different ways. Wow, 
that's fascinating. Um, so is there anything else that you want to share with our viewers and listeners when it comes to drug testing? I think you all have thoroughly covered it, you know, from what the drug testing you know, process is, how people try to cheat the system, why employers ask for it, and then also touching in on the, you know, those safe, safety sensitive uh, jobs where you can't use it at all. And if you get caught, you probably get, you lose your job. So is there anything else that you'd like to add for our listeners and viewers um, when it comes to drug testing for cannabis or any other kind of uh, drug that could impair them? Zathan? Yeah. When you go to do a void, the urine is not blue. So just know you can't you can't have blue urine, and your and your body is ninety eight point six degrees. So if it's not registering, it's not you. So and it's not if it's over a hundred degrees, you're bawling and your brain is bawling. So you need to get to the hospital. So those things there, you know. You, and I'm saying that's why Miss Kelly laughed because we've seen blue, you know, green. It's like oh I'm sick. I have an infection. Well, you I think you're dead, buddy, because it's blue. <laughs> goodness. Kelly? A lot, a lot of the things that we see are humorous. We, Zathan and I both have talked about writing a book, but it would be, you know, it's like, when do you stop the chapters? Because, you know, every time they come up with a different way to test, there's going to be a different way to thwart the test. Yeah, They're already talking about with the oral fluid, when you stick the swabs in their mouth, having some type of device that has dog spit or someone else's spit in it so that you know you can thwart the test that way. So every time there's a new way to test, there's gonna be another way to thwart. So our book would just get bigger and bigger or we'd have multiple, you know, multiple volumes. <laughs> wow, so with that, any closing comments? I mean, th this is completely fascinating. I, the blue urine piece um, and the boiling of the urine, I'm probably gonna chuckle pretty heavily when I get off the show, but any closing thoughts for folks um, that you'd like to share with them just for their understanding and education on this topic? Ms. Kelly? I think, um, I think being in drug testing at this juncture is interesting with all the cannabis laws and rules. And when we look at drug testing, as an industry, we've always been about safety. We've always been about making sure that people stay safe. It's never been about trying to get you. It's never been about impairment. And the reason impairment has started to come into the conversation is because we don't have a good way to test marijuana. You know, marijuana has always been illegal. So they, they, there was never a reason to develop a test. So that whole impairment thing has never really applied to drug testing. It's always been about deterrence. Mm -hmm. It's always been about, we want to keep you safe, you know, so we want to make sure that's why you're randomly drug testing. That's the best way to know if your people are safe is to make sure you're randomly testing them. So they never know when you're going to test them, then they won't use. Same thing with your kids in high school. A lot of the high schools got to drug testing because they knew if the children had an opportunity to say no, a lot of them would. They said, no, I can't do that because I'll get kicked off the football team or no, I can't do that. I'll get kicked out of band. Oh, it's the same thing with employees. So drug testing in and of itself has never been about impairment. It's just looking at the whole marijuana conversation is, is really, it's going to be interesting. We're going to have a lot of, a lot more things to talk about next time you call us up, I'm sure. Well, well let me ask you this. Is your industry booming because more and more states are legalizing it? Well, it from the testing from the testing end, yeah. I, I don't know if that's true or not because there's people that are dropping marijuana, but from the drug usage end, oh. COVID, a lot of people started using drugs and drinking more during COVID. So we're still booming from that. Okay. And just the increase of people trying to do something besides I mean, everybody sat at home for two and a half, three years. Right. What do you do when you're home? Well, everybody in the neighborhood was sitting out in the driveway drinking beer with their neighbors. Right. So people that don't normally drink on a daily basis were drinking on a daily basis. Then you've got, you know, the opioid crisis, which now has turned into the fentanyl crisis, which, you know, yeah. that's an ongoing thing. Yeah. So I just think it's it has to do with the influx of drugs and alcohol through the COVID era as far as marijuana i i know that we're starting to see some employers drop marijuana but they're not dropping drug testing yeah. because drug testing is up 
yeah. you know, positive drug tests are up. So they're not dropping it. It's just changing. And I think that's where the conversation comes in is as we're looking at how this is changing, how the testing method changes, mm -hmm. how marijuana is going to change the whole face of drug testing. But the safety sensitive and the ter deterrence part will never leave. You do not want an 18 wheeler, a guy, you know, running a truck or driving an airplane that's inebriated. Either he's high on marijuana or he's drunk. It's the same. That is the same conversation. Yeah. Nathan, any closing thoughts? Yeah, actually, we talked about all the rules and things like that, and drug testing, drug use. The one thing we, that we didn't talk about, and Ms. Kelly, tell me if I'm wrong, as, as an employee, if you do have a drug or alcohol problem, if you go to your employer before a drug test and tell them that you have a problem, they cannot fire you. They have to get you to some type of rehab. Well, not to get you, but they have to give you the information to go to a rehab or a detox facility to get you some help. So that's one thing a lot of people don't know and don't understand that. If you go before you get selected and say, hey, look, I got a problem. Now they have, I forgot what that law, that rule is, but they have it to where you ask that the employer has to give you, try to give, all, give you all the information they can on rehab so you can get you some help and they can't fire you. Hmm. But that's, the twist, that's the other twist to that. A lot of places call it last chance. Last and chance. And sometimes they'll give you last chance after you fail a drug test. If you tell them, even if you go to them beforehand, then you're not going to have that failed drug test. So if they had to fire you, they wouldn't fire you. But if you do fail the drug test, there's other companies that'll still have a last chance policy because they don't want to see, you know, an employee that they've had for 10 years have a, a you know, stupid incident. And then they lose that 10 years worth of value you know, by not having that employee anymore. And they could give them last chance where they can go get help and they can. And during that time when they're getting rehabbed and all that, of course, there would be drug tests and alcohol tests, whatever's appropriate mm -hmm. at a more elevated rate. So if you were getting maybe drug tested randomly and you're only getting pulled because of the luck of the draw once a year, you might be pulled in a in a last chance agreement it's not even a random thing they're they tell you we're going to drug test you every week or every month or every two months or and we're going to do this for a set number of years to make mm -hmm. sure you're in compliance wow that's good well we just got a comment from katrina rivers who said eap employee assistance program she thank just you that. <laughs> thank you katrina thanks for watching the show thanks katrina all right. Well, Kelly and Zathan, thank you so much for being a guest on our Conversations on Cannabis Virtual Forum, brought to you by the Medical Marijuana Education and Research Initiative at Florida a and University. Thank you to everyone watching this program. Tell us what you think about this forum by completing the survey that will be posted in the comment boxes on YouTube and Facebook after this live program. If you complete the survey, your name will be entered into a drawing on May 11th, 2023 to win a $100 gift card provided by one of Mary's partners. We wanna encourage you to go to the Florida Department of Health Office of Medical Marijuana Use website to learn how to obtain a legal medical marijuana card in the state of Florida. We also encourage you to go to the Florida a and University Mary website to learn more about this initiative, its educational programs, and additional information about cannabis use in Florida. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you. Bye.